let's prepare our hearts as we step into the Word and learn how we can be a community living new life in Jesus, loving God, connecting together, and living on mission in our world. Well, good morning, church. How you guys doing? Good, 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 good. If you would, grab your Bibles and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If we haven't had the opportunity to be introduced, my name is Neil. I serve as one of our servant leader pastors here, and um, it's a great opportunity to open up God's Word with you. Um, if you are a guest, I definitely encourage you to grab one of those gift bags in the foyer. Number one, there's free stuff. If you don't like free, what the heck's wrong with you? But, um, but there's stuff in there that'll let you know a little bit more about who we are. Like, you know, for me and everything, I'm always kind of like, let me, you know, let me kick that tire a little bit first before I, you know, jump in with you. Um, so that's a great opportunity to do that. That little bag will kind of give you some insight into what goes on in our adult ministry, our student ministry, our kids ministry, um, some of the other churches we're connected to um, internationally, nationally, and locally. Um, it's always a little leery to show up to a church that's not connected to something that's local, national, and international. I'd be leery of that, just an opinion. Um, but with that said, 1 Corinthians 13. This morning we are in our third message in a series in which we're really kind of considering what we value as a church and kind of what we're doing as a church fellowship through four what we would call missional mandates, all to serve a singular vision. And that vision is to see new life in Jesus. That, that's the vision. And this morning, as we pick up our, our time in God's Word, I, I want to focus on a piece of really our dream. See, here's our dream. Let me put it up for you up on the screen. Our dream is to be a community living new life in Jesus. Our dream is to be a community loving God. That's what we're going to look at today. Our dream is to be a community that, that's connecting together. And our dream is to be a community that lives on mission. You say, well, where do you want to do all that? In our world. In our world. That's what we want. You say, you want to conquer the whole world? No, I want you to conquer your world. Like, <laughs> wherever your sphere of influence is, to engage in that. To learn what it means to be alive. As a whole person. Body, soul, and spirit. To finally find that love partner. To finally be in a connected community that will outlast family, vocation, and athletic. And to finally have conscious purpose. It is what you are designed for. Whether you know Jesus or not, this resonates with you. You may not like it, but it is your DNA as human. This is who you are. It's what you've been created to do. And where you learn that is in this book of 66 collections of over a century and a half, well, millennia and a half of writings from different continents and different languages and different vocations who are inspired by God to piece together something that used to be called the book. That's what Bible means, the book. <laughs> there is a book. It's called the book. And so this morning, we're picking up where Pastor John left off last Sunday. Last Sunday, Pastor John shared and expounded a little bit upon how to live new life in Jesus. Not, not just why, but here's what the great thing about last week's message. And if you missed it, you missed it. You're never going to experience life if you missed last Sunday. No, there's opportunities to check it out. But the how. The how is where the brilliance is. Everybody has a dream, right? Everybody's got great ideas. But who wins the day? The one who outlasts you. That's who wins the day. How do I experience new life? I, I don't know. You're going to have to check that out from last week if you didn't get it. But this morning, I'd like to share a simple message on, on this theme. Loving God. Let's throw that slide up if we can. There we go. Loving God. 
Loving God. Now, let me say this. I found this interesting. I did a little bit of research. Did you know that the word love appears 310 times in the King James Bible, 348 times in the New American Standard Translation, 551 times in the New International Version, and 538 times in the New Revised Standard Version. So what we're going to do today is consider all the implications of all those verses. Does that sound good? No, I can't do that. 538 verses in just one translation? No, that's crazy. Needless to say, our time together will not and cannot be exhaustive on on this topic. This is called your life. But here's what it can be today. I do think we can do this. I can tell you why this statement loving God, is a part of our heartbeat. I can tell you why right after new life in Jesus, it's first. I think I can. And I think I can tell you how, as a community, we are strategically structuring our days so that we can position ourselves to both receive and express love, that there's a strategy there, that life isn't lived haphazardly or half-baked, but it's been thought through. Here's what I think I can do. I think I can take 35 minutes. I think I can. I'm going to do a little engine that could. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can take 35 minutes and share those two things. Why is this so important? And how can you engage? That's all we want to do today. So you may not know this, but you have been designed to experience deep, satisfying fulfillment. That's why you're still bored. That's why you're still looking to that next vacation to do it, or that next job, or that next marriage partner, or that next church after you've been here today. Oh, that next one. You're still looking for it. You're designed, in my opinion, for deep, satisfying fulfillment. That's what I think. You've been created to have someone pursue your heart. You have. And you've been created to be known and loved to the brim. Where you can trust someone. That's what you've been designed to do. You've been created to have confidence That everything that happens in life is filtered by someone who's designing your days. And you can trust that things are fathered, filtered. And you are created to know deep in your soul that nothing will separate you from love. That's what you yearn for as one who is in this human existence. Father, I pray as we consider this theme of loving God that you'd help me to serve your people well. That I would not give opinion or perspective, but just truth. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. New life in Jesus. Spiritual life begins once you're born again. John 3.16 In response to the gospel, hearing the proclamation of who Jesus is and what he's done, You you confess and repent sin, lack, not hitting the bullseye. Half the battle is awareness. Half the battle is recognition that there's a problem. You've heard about that if you've ever been through any kind of social work or counseling that denial is the first enemy to kind of break through. Well, you got to get real. First and foremost, you must recognize that you're not perfect. Now, there's some people out there that don't know that. But when you can awaken to that truth that I, I, I am kind of in need, <laughs> I, I need a savior, I'm going to confess that. The Greek word there is homo legea, meaning to speak the same thing that someone else says. And I'm going to repent. It has nothing to do with physical actions. It has everything to do with a mindset. That's what repentance is. It's I'm changing my mind. Repentance and confession align. Where head, heart, and hand comes together and says, yes, I am in need. 
But then secondarily, you say the same thing, not just away from sin, but towards God. You know the best way to kill a bad habit? Replace it with the right one. What's the right habit in life? A God-centered life, not an ego-centered life. But many Christians still live in egocentric Christianity. Christ is not the center of life. It's still you. You just prayed some prayer and thought you got to get out of hell card. You're missing it, man. You're missing it. It's about you dying and letting go of passion, letting go of your pursuits, letting go of your opinion, letting go of your dream, and saying, God, you do it. I want your dream. I want your passion. I want your opinion. What you say is what I say. That's what I say. Then you have begun the journey of just becoming a normal Christian. Read the book, The Nominal Christian Life, and you'll say, that's what a, just a basic Christian is? Someone who actually doesn't live for themselves? Where are these people? <laughs> How can I hang out with them? Where can I find them? Sometimes you'll find them in church. Sometimes. But in response to the gospel, you confess and repent of sin and you confess and receive Jesus. That's how you begin life again. And then you're baptized. And baptism is the public way to declare, the public way to celebrate, the public affirmation of what's happened. It doesn't save you, but it does publicly declare. It does give you a platform to celebrate. It does give you a platform to communicate what's happened. That's what baptism is. It's your first step towards publicly demonstrating and declaring new life in Jesus. And then you begin to grow. You begin a journey of spiritual life where you can begin to live life to the fullest. John 10.10 10. And you begin to experience grace. I used to have a professor that told me this. Neil, the grace of God is like a loaf of bread. Salvation is just the first slice. Everything remaining in your Christian journey is because of the grace of God, because of the goodness of God. We are saved by grace and we live in obedience by grace, not by grit. By grace, not by grit. So what does this lifestyle, this journey look like? What are the defining characteristics of an apprentice of Jesus? Listen to the words of Jesus as recorded for us by a guy that knew him when he was a teenager. John 13, 35. Jesus is recorded as saying this. Your love for yourself will prove to the world that you're my disciples. No, he didn't say that. Your love for your political candidate will prove to the world that you're my disciples. No, he didn't say that. Your love for one another will prove that you are my disciples. Pop quiz, eyes open, wake up again. Everyone's got to answer this question out loud. If not, you're going to have to stand up and come up here and answer. No, I'm just teasing. But what will prove that you are a disciple of Jesus? Starts with an L. Loving one another. Loving one another. That's what proves it. You say you love Jesus. What did last week look like for others? Where is your money spent? Is it on others? I don't know, man. This is what Jesus said. That this is what proves love. How you approach others. And I do it in this way. Maybe it's like this little, you know, thing. Tack. Your thoughts, your attitudes, and your choices. That's what shows me who you are. Your thoughts, your attitude, and your choices. How, how do I... What, what are you thinking about? Well, me. I'm thinking about, when, why is my coffee line so long? And why? And why? And you're still living egocentrically. No wonder you're miserable. No wonder you got no friends. Nobody wants to hang around an egocentric person. Listen to the words of Jesus as to the greatest thing you could do with life. Matthew used to be a tax collector. This guy that nobody liked. Matthew chapter 22. Someone asked Jesus, what's the greatest thing 
in the commandments. This is basically what he's saying. Jesus, if you were to say what's the best thing in life you could give yourself to, is it medicine? Is it law? Is it marketing? Is it construction? Is it, what is it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is it. It's love. It's love. It's love. Why should we do this? Does this mean that when you come to church, you're here to run down God? Like, God, I've been bad this week, so i got to connect with you. Right? Like, God, I feel like you're not here, so I'll come to this place where the air condition's on, the lighting's good, and there's coffee, and there's smiling faces, and I'll, I'll pursue you there. Let me ask this question. Why should we do this? Is it like we're here to pursue and run down the heart of God? 1 John 4 says this. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because like the Lego movie, we're awesome, right? No, we love him because he first loved us. Let me say this in Jesus' name and as with much compassion as I can and let me see your eyes. You are not awesome, <laughs> right? Now you're awesome in Jesus, but like if you feel like someone should treat you in a certain way because I'm awesome, you know what another one of my professors once said? He said, Neil, you want to know how you're really a servant? I said, yeah, tell me. You're going to tell me. Here it comes. You're a servant when someone treats you like a servant and you don't react. And that changes your perspective. Because if someone treats you like, hey, that guy didn't say hi to me. That guy disrespected me. That guy slanted me. That guy stung on me. And that bothers you? Still got work to do, man. You're still egocentric. Now, I'm not talking about being a doormat. Please don't misinterpret and twist. And I'm talking about you getting aggro when someone cuts you off on 98. Or they don't turn when they're supposed to turn. Or the, li the, li the line to get to turn, it's here. And then they go right here. Why do people do that? Get in the turning lane. See, I still got a long way to go. I'm still very egocentric. I'm not saying, like, I've conquered this. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Like, this isn't like Neil, like, oh, this is how I do it. Like, no, <laughs> this, is the, this is what we're supposed to do together. We all need Jesus. Amen? Amen? Okay. So, you may ask, well, what really is love? 1 Corinthians 13, if you turn there with me, I'd love to read this passage to you. So very good. Reading this this morning from the New Living Translation, 1 Corinthians 13. Paul writes this to a church who thought they knew what love was but was using love to excuse disobedience and sin and debauchery and homosexuality and drunkenness. And they said, it's all love. Love is love. You think that's a new statement? That's from the first century, man. Everything is rehashed and repackaged. Bell bottoms will come back. Okay, anyway, 1 Corinthians 13. Here's what Paul wrote. If I could speak the languages of earth and angels, if I had the best marketing degree, but did not love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You ever heard one of those? Do we need to illustrate it? Should we go back there for an hour and just bang that thing? You'd be like, man, that's annoying. A talented person that doesn't love, that's annoying. If I had the gift of prophecy and I could understand all of God's secret plans. See, God has plans. It says it right there. And possessed all knowledge. And I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others. I'm nothing. Meaning someone who's got a huge social media presence, someone who's got that big account, and they're movers, they're shakers, they're mountain movers. They understand the intricacies of what's coming for you in the market, but they don't love nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor, this is the humanitarian, right? Sacrificed even my body, and I could boast about it, but I didn't really love others, I've gained nothing. Well, then what in the world is love? Because that's what I thought it was. Well, verse 4, love is patient. No, that's too practical. <laughs> love is kind. Not when you got a two-year-old that's sick. Yeah, it's kind. Love's not jealous of your spouse or boastful or proud or rude. 
Love doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable, keeps no record of being wronged, does not rejoice in the injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins the day. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful, and love endures every circumstance. I must be honest with you, and I've met some amazing people in the short time that I've been on this planet. I've not, I haven't met that person. I'm not that person. I've not met that person in the flesh. But I have met him. There is one who did this. And that would love to do this through you. The secret of Christianity is Christ in you. That's your hope of glory. It's not you. It's not you. It's you dying and staying connected to the vine. Isn't that paradoxical? That's the way it works. See, in my opinion, true love is otherworldly. It's something we won't perfectly encounter on this side of eternity. But we can taste it. And we can grow in it. And the best love relationship to get right is the vertical. Everyone wants the horizontal relationships to be loving, right? Good luck with that, man. Because those require participatory relationships. And not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to respect you. Not everybody's going to love you. But there is one who his door is always open. And if you get that relationship right, even if these relationships aren't right, you're good. You're good. And some of these will be good. Because there are some Christians out there, I'll be honest with you, I've met them. Some of you guys, I never know you guys, you guys are awesome. There are some of them out there. But here comes the question. Is there something that I can, better yet, is there something that we can, as a community, do? Because we're doers, right? We're Americans. If you ever travel outside of America, you're going to go, oh, that's the doer, the American. To intentionally, specifically, routinely, and rhythmically engage to position ourselves to grow, to move forward to fall deeper in love with God every single week. Is there something we can do? I believe there is. I believe you're doing it right now. Say, what do you mean? You see, as the lead pastor of our church, I believe it's incumbent upon me to pray and to process and to plan through some of the organic and strategic avenues by which we can serve you as God's people to be fully in love with God, connected together and living on mission. My experience with organic strategies or organic avenues is that they're organic. You can't plan those things. Like God does things in a moment that you weren't, oh man, I ran into that guy at the gas station. and Man, that helped encourage me to grow in my walk. Like God does those things. God's sneaky in his design for your days. He doesn't tell you everything. There's like little surprises that you think are interruptions throughout your day that he's trying to do something. But, God's got the organic thing down. I can't do that. But is there something we can do? Here's what I think. I think we can create environments for kids, students, and adults to love Jesus through preaching the gospel and teaching the Bible, engaging in meaningful worship and song, engaging in meaningful fellowship and prayer, offering meaningful times of communion through the elements of the bread and the wine, offering clear opportunities to give and to join a serve team, and always an invitation to your next step. You say, what do you mean by that? Salvation, baptism, communion, growth track, connect group, or serve team. Every Sunday, we seek to invest in three environments to first and foremost draw our attention to God and do what he told us to do, to love him. Two-year-olds matter. A junior high student matters. A 95-year-old matters. They have equal value, dignity, and worth because they're created in the image of God. But I will say, if we were to leverage our money, our time, our interest into what potentially, don't be offended by this, potentially has more bang for the buck, it's the two-year-olds. It's the three-year-olds. 
It's the four-year-olds, the five-year-olds, the six-year-olds, the seven-year-olds, the eight-year-olds, the nine-year-olds, the 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 21. Everyone else, hope it works out for you. No, 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 just kidding. <laughs> but that's when you're making decisions that will impact the rest of your trajectory. So our environments for our children's ministry and our student ministry should foster a student to fall in love with Jesus, not loathe church attendance. Why? I want them to do well. I don't want them to have baggage that I'm responsible for. Every Sunday, we seek to invest in three environments. Adults, students, and children. To draw our attention to God, not to a band, not to a communicator, not to a program, not to a slick presentation, but to God. To love Him because we, He first loved us. That's the goal. Now, how do you do that? This is my opinion. This is why I think in-person gatherings, I'm going to even say that in a COVID culture. This is why I think in-person gatherings on the first day of the week, have value. Doesn't mean you can't do online. But this is why I think this should never go away, is all I'm trying to say. Not saying we don't leverage online. Online has tremendous potential. But by coming in person, you evidence that you believe that Christianity is about we, not me. And you don't live in a culture that embraces that. You don't even live in a Christian culture that embraces that. Because if, if you were here in the 80s and 90s, like you were a human, it was all about you and Jesus and that personal relationship on the beach. And that's good. You need a personal relationship in community. Make sure you qualify that. Because it's not all about you, Jesus, a Bible, a beer, and a boat, and three people, and you just did church. What a fool. No. 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 The language of your proof text is about church discipline, if you know the, what's being read in Matthew. It's not to excuse you getting out of bed and doing what? Well, serving. I mean, to be honest with you, you may not know this, but I don't come to church to hear a sermon. Did you know that? Hopefully you don't either. Hopefully you come here to serve and to worship God through what happens in the sermon. But there's other things here to serve, to give to pray, to sing. You are not here to consume. If you have been, and you're like, oh, I'm church shopping so I can find out which one I can consume, man, go somewhere else. Because you're a consumer. We don't need that. We need contributors. We need what Jesus called partners, members of a body. Not a consumer who sits back and goes, well... I don't. Who cares what you don't? Like, who really cares, man? See, what should we do when we get to church? Coffee, entertaining music, stimulating, topical, moralistic, deistic pep talk? No. Here's what we need. We need to gather to hear the gospel preached. We need to gather to sing because God is worthy. We need to gather to learn about God through his inspired word. We need to engage in meaningful prayer, engage in meaningful fellowship, engage in times of communion, engage in sacrificial giving, engage in serving others, and be encouraged and exhorted to live on mission in your world this week. And if you haven't been baptized, to be invited to sign up for that. So I can't write all that down. Okay, well then get your pen out and write this down. Here's the first thing we need to be doing on a Sunday morning to gather. First one, we're going to put it up on the screen. Preach the gospel. The gospel needs to be preached when, when you are gathered with God's people. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul wrote this. I passed on to you what was most important. Make sure you have the best coffee. No, no, no. I passed on to you what was most important. This is what had been passed on to me. Here it is. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he raised again on the third day. Make sure that's most important. The gospel. The second thing. Baptism. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. 
Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Does that mean at every worship gathering there has to be baptism? No, don't fall into a legalistic weirdness. But there's this dynamic where there's always this opportunity that if you haven't been baptized, go to the connect table, talk to Tabitha, and we'll sign you up. Number three, there should be worship in song and in life. Romans chapter 12 says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God as your reasonable service of worship. Psalm 95 says, come and sing to the Lord. Number four, there should be meaningful prayer. James chapter 5 says, confess your sins to the priest behind a robe. No, he says, confess your sins to each other. Did you hear that? To each other. And pray for each other so you may be healed. So you mean you don't have to talk to Neil to get prayed for? No, you have to talk to Jesus. That's the one who you want to talk to. But there's others that you should do it with. Church is about we, not me. Number five. Learn the Bible. Why? Because 2 Timothy 3 says all scripture is inspired and it's actually useful. And it says it's useful to teach you what's true and make you realize what's wrong and to correct you when you are wrong and to teach you what to do what's right. Who doesn't want to make mistakes in life? Nobody starts life and says, you know what I want? I want eight divorces, five business failures, and 18 renegade kids. That's what I want out of life. Nobody wants that. You say, I'd like to learn. Is there a way to like, learn from others' mistakes and like, not have 18 renegade children? Is there a way to do that? Yes, there's a way. There's a way. Doesn't mean if you have a child who's gone wayward, you've done something wrong. Why? Remember about those horizontal relationships? They're participatory. You can't control. You can only influence. And if you keep trying to spin the currency of control, you're, you're using the wrong dollar, man. You're supposed to be using influence, not control. Control has value when they're two years old and they're taking a fork and trying to put it into a light socket. You need to control that. Like, you can't influence. Oh, dear, sweet honey, please don't do that. You have parents that do that, right? They, they, bought, they got it upside down. They thought they, they're doing the influence way too soon. They're like, I want to be your friend. Like, okay, they need a mom, you know, like. But then eventually, they do need a friend. Just don't do it at the wrong time. Control comes first. Influence comes second. Number six, receive communion. Why is communion important? Jesus said in Luke 22, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's important because Jesus says it's important. That's why communion is important. Number seven, live in community. Acts chapter 2 we see both a description and a prescription of the church. They gathered together regularly. Number eight, giving. 2 Corinthians 9 says you should decide in your heart how much to give. He didn't say this. You should decide in your heart if you give. He didn't say that. He said you should decide in your heart how much. What is the understanding there? That being a Christian means you're a giving person. If you can't trust God with 0.001%, what is wrong with you? You're living too tight. Like if you can't trust God with 0.001%, like start there. If you feel like I can't give 10%, can you give half a percent? What, to the church so they can do? No, to God and trust that what he's doing with it is what he's doing with it. That's freedom. To give and say there's no strings, man. Just like I love doing that with people. Like I love doing that with my kids. You say, what do you mean? I don't have a lot of money. So I say, hey, here is one dollar and it's yours. As long as it doesn't, what you get doesn't hurt you or kill you or hurt or, or your brother or sister, go for it. That's the most fun way to give because your heart's not still attached to it and you get to see what they do with it. If you're not giving, you're not living as a Christian. That's what the Bible says. Okay. Number nine, live to serve. Oh my goodness, you mean when I show up to church, it's not about being a pew potato? No, it's about being active in serving. There are seven serve teams here on a Sunday morning. Let me ask you a question. In the last 12 months, have you been a part of one? If not, why not? Why not? I'm not asking you to do it 365, 24-7, but like three months? 
out of the year, a month, a day, like maybe, and, and some of them are super easy. Like when people walk in the door, you just say, hi, that was it. You did it. You're on the serve team. You made it. Like, it's not like this. Oh, I don't know, man. I'm not qualified. You can't say hi. Like you're not on a serve team. Why? Well, me, uh, there's this sport and this thing. And oh, you still bought into me, not we. Okay. Okay. Number 10, to live on mission. When you gather with God's people, you should be encouraged to step into your week and go make disciples. Moms, you've got the best opportunity in the world because you've got these little ones that are right there with you. Business owners, you've got an amazing opportunity. If you've got employees, you kind of have influence over their schedule. Are you caring for them? Are you structuring their days where they're maybe even doing some self-assessment? Or are you just working them like a workhorse for your bottom dollar? Man, treat people well. God won't give you more if you don't treat the ones well that you have. It makes no sense. See, how do we live life to the fullest? How do we begin to live in love with our creator? 10-4-1. Live your values. And make a plan. Well, what's the plan? 9 a.m. church, I'm there, man. Even if we're flooding, I'm there. In-person attendance matters. It matters. And it will be challenged. It will be challenged. Because the enemy knows it matters. It matters. Now, if you're physically unable, come on, man, everything has context. But if it's like 9 a.m. and you're physically healthy and able and you're like, well, is it a boat day or a church day. I'll already tell you, you're way off. That, sh that question should never even be entertained in front of your kids. Because you're telling them what matters to you is me, not the other people we should go to church with. Some of you, some of us, I've never even considered that your presence is not just about you, but it's about the person next to you at church. Some of us are just so like consumeristic. And I know it's, it's not really your fault. You're American. So like that's the culture around you. But you go to Italy, it's not like that. Like we're not the only people in the world. And we don't do everything right as Americans. I know that may sound like, can you say that in a church? Like we do a lot of things right, I think, in my opinion. But there's other humans in the world. Now, this is where I'll wrap this up. Let me ask you a question. Are you leaning in or leaning back? That's the question. When you gather on a Sunday morning, do you lean in or do you lean back? So you mean if my back's on the chair, I'm no longer a Christian? No, this is what I mean. Are you serving? Are you giving? Are you learning? Are you singing? Are you praying? Are you fellowshipping? Is communion meaningful to you or is it just routine? When we have a baptism, do you go and celebrate with others? Or you say, well, I've already been baptized. Why would I go to that? Because you're a me versus we guy. That's why. That's why you think that way. Is in-person weekly attendance even priority? According to Pew Research, on average, 69% of U.S. adults were members of a church from 1998 to the year 2000. Another study was done in 2016 to 2018, and this record is as of April of 2019, that only 52%. That means there was a 17% decrease in normal weekly attendance. No wonder we're looking to other things to fill our love void. Because I think that this is what God created. I'm going to create a gathering or it's like going to the gym for a Christian. Hey, every Sunday, be there and sing and learn and give and fellowship and pray and learn and all those things. And these are the tools. This is the way it happens. It's the tool in your tool belt. Like this right here is a tool, right? It's also like kind of annoying. Like it's always talking to you when you put it on. But it's a tool that has different applications. And you use those different applications for different purposes, but really they're all to do one thing. What? To serve you, right? That's what it's for. Singing, serving, 
learning, giving, praying, fellowshipping, being encouraged to live on mission, those are about God. It's about God. Can I have your attention? Your life is not about you. The wrong question is, God, what's your will for my life? Wrong question. When you ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers. The right question is, God, what is your will and how can my life accomplish that? Right question. Yes, you're on the right trajectory now. What is your will and how can I help with that? And then there's freedom. Then you're not so egocentric. Then you're not wondering, well, are they thinking about me? Are they thinking about me? Is she thinking about me? I can't go there. That person might be there. You kind of forget about all that because you're like, God's got so much for me to do, I can't even think about myself. <laughs> I just got to keep moving forward. If you're not engaged with the one who's meant to love you best, that's why your love tank is empty. You see, this is our goal as a church. We'll put it up on the screen one last time. To be a community living new life in Jesus. We talked about that last week. To be a community truly loving God. Well, how would we do that? Man, I tried to tell you, like learning and singing and giving and praying. And there's 10 of them. There's 10 ways. That, that's how you love. Because love's so ethereal, right? Like everybody loves. Show me how you learn about Jesus then. Show me how you serve others. Show me where you give. Show me how much you value church attendance. Show me your meaningful response to communion. Did you celebrate your baptism? Did you pray? No, I don't do that stuff. Then I'm just going to be honest with you, and you probably won't like me for this. That's okay. I've already got a friend. Her name's Cece. I don't need any more. Here's what I would say. Then, bro, you don't really love God. Not in the long run of your life. Because what you do is what defines you. What you do is what defines you. Not what you say. And here's the great thing. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. There's still hope for you. There's still hope for me. You know why? Because you're not dead. <laughs> like You're alive. And if there's breath, there's hope. If, there's, if you're conscious, there's hope. Your life is not a waste. You're not a failure because you've fallen you're a human if you've fallen you're a failure if you stay down you can get back up and you can start learning about jesus you can start praying god's not against you did you know that god's not angry at you right now i don't care who you are whether you love jesus or don't love. jesus paid for your debt he wants a relationship with you there is hope for you and this is where I'll end it. And I'm going to go ahead and invite the team up that leads us in song. It starts and it stays with a love relationship with God. Not a legalistic religion about God. That's the enemy's twisting. It's a love relationship with God. Not a legalistic structure of religion about God. No, that's hollow. Nobody wants that. It's about a love relationship with God. And if you don't have one, I invite you to start one today. How? Get real with God. Recognize that you're not perfect, that you need a Savior. Confess that He's a Savior and say, you know what, Lord, my life's yours. That's it. You're done. It's that simple. It's not like you got to, well, you need to come to this class and do this and pay John Spencer this much money. And like, it's not like that. It's not, you don't even have to go to church. Let me say this after just giving like the best message I know how about why church is important. You don't even have to go to church to be a Christian. You say, really? I thought you just said. But I'll tell you this, man. If you're a Christian, you're going to go to church. That's the way it's going to happen. God's so tricky like that, isn't he? Like, he's funny. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I invite you to start one today. In a little while, Pastor John's going to come and share about how to do that. If you have one, but you've drifted, I encourage you, repent Repent, man. Repentance is one of the sweetest words in the Bible. Engage with God. Reach out to Him and enjoy Jesus. And this is the last thing that I will say. Your life can be and should be 
about the joy of enjoying that knowing that you are enjoyed by God. Your life, it can be a joy. A joy. Why? Because you're living knowing that you are enjoyed by God. That when he looks at you, he says, there's that one, my boy, David. There's that one, my daughter. There's my son. I'm proud of him. I love her. And when you have the affirmation of a parent, it does something in your soul. And you may have never gotten that from your earthly parent, but your heavenly parent would say, I love you. You are all fair, my love. There is no spot in you, as the Song of Solomon says. You're forgiven. You're washed clean. You're made whole. You're brand new. Let's hang out. That's who Jesus is. And you don't have to live life alone. You don't have to live life going to places to look for love in all the wrong places, man. There's a place. It's at the foot of the cross. You're designed for deep, satisfying love. It's available to you if you want it. If you want it. It's all yours. Father, I thank you for this church. Let's stand together. I pray and ask as we, as we sing this song about your love, God, that you would, by your spirit, encourage our hearts to know that you're not angry at us or upset with us, but God, that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just going to ask a simple question. If you say, I don't know Jesus or I've drifted from Jesus and these 10 things that you're talking about, they're not a part of my life, would you just pray for me? I'm not asking you to come forward. I'm asking you to reach your hand up to heaven and say, Jesus, I want you. I want to serve. I want to give. I want to learn. I want to pray. I want to surrender my life. If that's you this morning and you want me to pray over you, I'm going to ask you right now to lift your hand so I can pray over you. If you're saying, Lord, I want to be yours in a fresh way, come into my life afresh. Use me for your kingdom and your glory. Lord, I thank you for each hand that's raised. I'm going to assume that every other hand is killing it with these 10 things then. So Lord, every hand who's raised here, do a work in their life. Pour out your spirit afresh. Give them a passion to know you, a passion to serve you. Let them let go of cold, dead religion and let them embrace blood-bought intimacy. May they live for you. May they love you. May they serve others. May you pour out blessing and provision and abundance so that they can pour that out to others. Not to hoard it for themselves, but to be a vessel through which to give. Bless each and every single person here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. I see.